Everybody. This is Dan Lapel for New Focus Recordings, and hi to all the folks, the great folks on the call who were involved in this wonderful album uh, by Curtis Hughes, Tulpa. And uh, glad we could sort of uh, gather you guys to talk about this. It came out in April, but uh, it's an album that I'm still listening to uh, on, a, on a regular basis, and I've just really enjoyed getting to know this music and, and hearing your wonderful performances. So uh, Curtis, why don't you sort of give us some background on, on some of these great collaborative pieces and, and the framing and how the album came together. Hey, Brian, welcome. Hello, sorry Hello. for the delay. Oh, no problem at all. Uh, so we're, we're just starting off the conversation uh, with Curtis giving us a sort of overview on, on the, how the whole thing came together. Uh, sure, uh, and it's been a long-term uh, process uh, most of the recording happened uh, pre-pandemic uh, in 2019, um, although there's a little bit of music that was recorded later on. But I'm glad to see everybody who's gathered here today because these are people that I really, really enjoyed collaborating with. And in some cases, these are people I have not seen uh, since before uh, the whole world shut down for a little while. Um, and I have uh, great collaborative relationships with, with everybody here. Um, probably the longest collaborative relationship with pianist Sarah Bob, uh, who's joining us. Um, even though Sarah only plays on one piece, the title track of the album, uh, uh, Tulpa, um, I, I have worked with Sarah for so long, I don't think I can write for piano without thinking of uh, Sarah's playing. So that's um, always in my mind. Uh, we've got two representatives here from Boston Percussion Group, uh, Brian Calhoun and Greg Simons. Um, and uh, the work Antichamber was uh, commissioned by Boston Percussion Group and written for them and very much with these, with these two in mind. Um, and that was, uh, I think, a, a work that was a little bit um, sort of different from anything that they had commissioned before and, and maybe make that made them uh, uh, sweat and uh, kind of stress out in ways that, um, uh, were a little intense at first, and I think the the piece had a lot a long evolution um, as they continued to uh, work on it. It evolved with them, and and I think of all of these pieces as not just mine, but um, really collaborations in that um, they are they're no longer what's just on the page. They really exist in these specific performances in my mind. That now these are these are the pieces, not not what's on the page. It's the album that constitutes the music. Um, and uh, Rose Hegley, who's here. Um, and you know, uh, 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 Rose, I think, is the one person who I collaborated with the most closely on the composition of Tulpa itself, in that, uh, although there's only one movement of the piece that has a vocal part, I um, had never said a French text before, and I needed to consult with Rose about that. Um, and we had some back and forth. Uh, uh, Rose consulted with her teacher a fair amount. Um, and uh, that was a really, really inspiring process. And kind of the whole rest of the piece was built around that. So that, that's the, the introduction to what the collaboration has been with all of these folks. Wonderful. Uh, well, maybe we can sort of start by talking uh, about and listening to a couple excerpts from Tulpa. But uh, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more, if you don't mind talking about the, the link with David Lynch that is sort of <laughs> the, like framing the, the, the piece. And I hope I'm not sort of putting you in a difficult position by forcing that, but, but I know it came up a, a bunch in the notes and in our discussions about the record when it came out. And it's, it seems like sure. people, people might be interested in, in hearing a little bit more about. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I um... Well, I do want to emphasize, first of all, that I intend it to be music that can be uh, appreciated in different ways by different people. I've never been someone who feels that with program music, for instance, 
it's essential to know about the program necessarily before enjoying a piece of music. Certainly when I compose, I don't want that to be a limitation. Um, so with David Lynch's work, which um, baffles me and frustrates me and occupies a lot of space in my mind a lot of the time, um, I just couldn't escape it when I was writing this particular composition. Uh, it was right after the, the third season of Twin Peaks had aired and I was still extremely confused over what I had seen and was trying to make sense of it. And the music was in a strange way, my trying to, trying to make sense of things like unresolved plot lines. Um, but uh, just as that's, uh, you know, from a television and film standpoint, work that no two people are gonna interpret the same way. I hope that that's true of the music as well, that everybody hears it a little bit differently. So there's no wrong or, or right way to hear it, but there's definitely some of the dark humor and surrealism and uh, imagery from Twin Peaks that found its way into the music for sure. Cool, that's, that's very interesting <laughs> to hear. Well, maybe, can we listen to a little bit of the vocal movement, uh, Un Amor Inconu? And maybe sure. give it a little context after after we listen to this one minute uh, excerpt. And this, of course, features features you, Rose, in a beautiful performance. So uh, let's check it out. Here we go. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, so that was the third movement, the one movement that sets text uh, from Curtis Hughes's Tulpa, uh, Un Amor Inconu. You want to set it up uh, or sort of give a little background to, to what we heard? That's, that was towards the end of the, the movement, correct? That's correct. Uh, the text is in French. It's from Proust, uh, who obviously is not David Lynch. Uh, but there was some imagery in common that seemed relevant to me. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm glad to have everybody gathered here and I've done uh, maybe too much talking already. I'd, I'd be curious to hear from Rose maybe about uh, what your experience was in learning that music and um, how, you, how you approached it. Thank you, Curtis, and thank you all so much. It's such a joy to be here and to talk about such a wonderful collaboration. Um, for me, this collaboration was super fulfilling because Curtis, you and I had worked together so closely and you specifically wrote for my voice. And I mean, I think we'd known each other for a semester before you started writing for me. So you'd had a chance to hear me, to hear my strengths, to hear the things that make me me. And in terms of your vocal writing, it feels very comfortable. It feels like, yes, it was written for me. And as a result, I was really able to take it in the first performance and the subsequent recording and really make it my own. And several of the features that I really love about it are the leaps, your microtones. I love how the violin and I are really in parallel for a lot of that section when it, when it gets a lot slower, a lot more mysterious. And I like how you really support the voice throughout, I believe through contrab and melody as well. So having different instruments playing different parts of the vocal line and each just bringing their own color and texture to support the voice in this context. And on a side note, one of the things I really love about Tulpa is the meta nature of the text. You specifically chose a text describing a phrase of music. So it's music about text about music. And I absolutely enjoy that, just wrapping my brain around that concept. And trying to figure out what else to add. It was, it was just such a fun collaboration. I really appreciate how closely we work together um, I'm Canadian, so I studied French in school, 
Um, so we were able to really, I was able to really draw upon that in thinking about diction and text setting just from my own experience. And it was, it was fun, a lot of back and forth, a lot of consultation. The premiere was great and Tulpa's Solar Mate is one of my favorite pieces to date. And the instrumentation is really unique because it was originally written for the students of Boston Conservatory's Contemporary Performance Program, of which I was a part. So it's a very, very, very interesting instrumentation reflecting the year in which it was composed, the specific students in that cohort, and just such a joy to sing. And again, one of my favorite collaborations. So thank you, Curtis. It's, it's been such a joy to live with this piece. And I want to give, I want to bring it back to life again soon. I should say one way in which, and thank you, Rose, it was wonderful, so wonderful to work with you and to know, uh, you know, who I was working with as I came up with that music um, and to know how many different things you could do with your voice, that risks I couldn't have taken uh, if I didn't know those things. Uh, there is, well, I don't know when we're going to be having performances of large ensemble like that, large ensemble music like that in the, in the near future, but uh, there is going to be a art film um, which uh, uh, my daughter Ariana is directing and which uh, features some uh, singing uh, by Rose in the woods last January. Um, and uh, we've, we've posted a couple little sneak snippets of that here and there, but um, the whole thing when it's finally ready, I think will be a, a nice way to revisit that, that music um, and might be a little more overt than the, in the Lynchian connections. The, the other three of you who are here collaborators uh, um, it's not, it's not impossible that I might still be calling on you to, uh, to make little cameos. We'll see. <laughs> Just looking at the personnel list for Tulpa, it's, it's great. I mean, it really speaks to what you were saying before about how this album is a culmination of, uh, a group of collaborators that you've been working with for so long. I mean, and I, I always want to make sure that I read, uh, who's actually playing. So I'm going to do that now. Alexis Lands on clarinet, Amy Advocat on bass clarinet. Jensen Ling on bassoon, Aaron Trant on percussion, Brian Calhoun on vibraphone, Greg Simons on marimba, Lilith Hartunian on violin, Bree Talia Farrow on cello, Ben Baker cello, Matt Chirac conductor, and Rose Hegley uh, soprano. And almost everybody on that list is on some other track. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah Bob on, on piano, which we somehow need to correct on the website. So uh, I'm, I'm glad we're noticing that now. Uh, and, and my, my sincere apologies for, for uh, the omission in both cases. Um, but uh, so many of those people are on other tracks on the album, I mean, nearly all of them. Uh, so whether or not it speaks to a sort of uh, preordained design for the record, I think it, it more speaks to a, a very uh, close knit community in Boston uh, of people who you've been really uh, enjoying working with and who've been loving playing your music for many years. So, and that comes through in the sound of the record. It, it, a lot of understanding and intelligence in terms of the interpretations uh, and the perspective on on what you're writing. So that's cool. Um, well, let's listen to another excerpt, and this is the 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 opening of the final movement, correct? Uh, the number of completion with this really wonderful bassoon uh, solo. Here we go. Yeah, uh, oh, uh, maybe just to introduce this, um, uh, uh, because Sarah is here, uh, I want to um, point out before this, before we hear this excerpt, um, there's a little duo featuring piano and percussion that follows uh, quite close on the heels of a bassoon solo at the opening of this movement. And this passage for piano and percussion harkens back to one of the earliest collaborations that I would reference here, which is um, a work uh, I composed more than 20 years ago for uh, Sarah and for Aaron Trant. Um, this is a, a, a piece that they performed even before they were married. Um, and uh, it really shaped my kind of idea of what collaboration could, could be um, in that it's a piece that um, uh, uh, kind of evolved through their performance of it. And so this little segment of Tulpa is kind of paying tribute to in a way that, that collaboration in the past. I don't know, Sarah, if you want to say anything before we hear it, or do you want to wait until afterwards? I can wait either either, either way. I mean, well, now I'm talking, so now I, I will talk. I mean, the thing, Curtis, is about 
everything you, you've been saying about really getting to know your players and um, it, it's so symbiotic because every time I get a piece from Curtis, I really do feel like it's written for me, even if it's wicked hard. Like I feel like he's there's still an understanding of who I am as a player. Um, uh, Curtis has a way of uh, just hitting all of the things I love doing best when I perform, which for me personally is being like the most raucous, but also being the most gentle. He has this incredible way of utilizing these two um, uh, opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, he uses the piano as, as such an awesome percussion instrument, which is something that I really, um, I, I feel like I thrive with, I, I'm energized by that. But he also gives me the opportunity to be melodic and gentle and um, it's, it's, the whole, it's the whole package. And I've always been very grateful for that opportunity to really be able to express myself so fully through his notes. Um, and I mean, any project Curtis wants to do, if he calls me, I'm, I'm there. He's, um, he's the, the motor, uh, the energy, the, um, it's all so thrilling to work on and then to, to, ex to be able to execute and to be able to listen to. I mean, listening to this before we, we got on today, I listened to the whole album again. And I mean, there's an energy that, that flows through the whole thing that, um, is very unique, I think, to Curtis, and I'm grateful to be a part of it. It's great to see you all. I hope we get to do this piece again live or live <laughs> sometime. Great, thanks, thanks, Sarah. Let's let's listen to this excerpt of the last movement, and we can chat about it a bit more. Wonderful. So uh, we just heard uh, a minute from the last movement of the title work of this uh, album, Tulpa, The Number of Completion. And the ending of that was sort of apropos to where we're headed in terms of our talk, because the, the opening album, the opening of the album features two pieces for percussion. First, uh, Flagrant for solo snare drum and then Antichamber, which features the Boston Percussion Group, uh, two members of which we have here. Uh, Gregory Simons and Brian Calhoun. So we sort of, uh, the album and the chat are nicely sort of eating their own tail, uh, which is which is always fun. But I, th I thought uh, in terms of the balance of this album, it's a really unique and, and effective flow from these very focused uh, percussion sounds in the first two track tracks to this sort of opened up sound world in terms of lush harmonies and lyricism uh, by the end. Do you guys want to talk a bit about Antichamber, uh, the percussion ensemble piece, and set that one up, and then we'll listen to an excerpt from that as well? Sure. Yeah, I'm I'm Brian, and my buddy Greg here. We were we are half of the Boston Percussion Group, and it was such a thrill, such a meaty hard thrill to work with Curtis and to perform this piece and bring it to life. Um, I remember Curtis, I think the first time we performed it was at Jonathan Hess's um, studio in East Boston. Was that right? Um, I think that's kind of where our, our inaugural performance of it was. We had then that performed correct, a couple yeah. times yeah, to kind of get it in shape. Uh, I mean, it was such a blast because Curtis takes like Rose, you were saying, he gets to know the musicians really well and he writes for our unique combination, our unique quartet. 
you know, we had marimba, vibraphone, drum set, and percussion, kind of a mixed ensemble. And he writes, to be honest, like at our limit. I mean, if you were to ask me like, oh, can you do X, Y, or Z? I'd be like, yeah, I think so. He's like, all right, well, we're just gonna like live there and push you against like right up to that edge of what you think you can or can't do. There's some really complex um, polyrhythms and really complex composite like pocket things between players. And it's the kind of stuff that, you know, you're kind of like running on a high speed rail. And if something goes wrong, you could totally crash and burn. But if you stay on it, if you trust the other members of your ensemble, which of course I do with my life, you can sail through it and it kind of like elevates you all. So there's definitely challenges that pushed us, I think past what honestly we thought we could do that we totally did. And it stretched us as a group. It definitely pushed me as a player. And I'm so grateful because the composite was, or the result was this piece that though difficult is absolutely worth every detail and every part and every challenge. Um, it was like a thrill to do. Uh, I don't know, Greg, what, what did you feel? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, and I would add that to that, uh, it's, it's sort of the right type of hard. It's the type of hard that makes you wanna keep doing it until you get it right. And it's so satisfying when you do get it right, where there's other types of hard where it's just like, this is a drag that I have to learn. I have to pick out this D sharp and this whatever, like figure out all these little details. This is the right type of hardware. Like you just push yourself. It's almost like you're going down a, uh, a mogul's course as a skier. And every time we would set up to play this course in concert or this piece in concert, it's just like running a mogul's course. You're like, okay, here we go. And as soon as you jump in, there's almost no exit point until you get to the ending. Uh, and I really liked what Sarah said also about um, if you played drop the needle with this piece, antechamber, you sometimes would come up with two different pieces. Like if you drop the needle around C, you've got this crazy drum set, bass mm -hmm. drum. It's, and another thing about the being a good part of art is like we practice so much, I remember the rehearsal numbers or the rehearsal letters. So like if you, if you drop the, the needle around C, you've got this rhythmic part that's just hocketing back and forth. It's really aggressive. And if you, if you drop the needle around the M part, there's this sort of serene landscape where there's just a little bit of gong and these ringing sounds. And it's just, it's so diverse. And it's almost, it's, to me, it's like um, you've got this sort of Acme cartoon machine that's like putting a process in motion. And then when you get to the end of that process, there's another process that starts and it's just like sort of this never ending, uh, I guess the ski slope is the best way to put it. Yeah, I definitely will agree with the whole idea of this like it, this incline that basically it, there's momentum. Once you start, you can't really stop and you have to keep going all the way through it. It's definitely, exhilarating it's exhausting but in the best way like greg said it's the right kind of hard that you feel really proud what you've created after all the work is put in yeah here you guys talk about this and curtis i, I think you studied with lee hyla correct uh i did I, yeah. I feel that this there's an affinity here because i i the way you're describing this mogul experience reminds me of of a lot of hyla's pieces too in the more sort of uh, dynamic, uh, exuberant sections, and and this set sense that the audience is uh, along for the perilous part of the ride, you know, <laughs> uh, and very much invested in it in the idea that you're going to stay on top of the skis, I assume as well. But uh, uh, I don't know if that's I'm I'm sure that that isn't a quality you necessarily learned from him, but it might have been something that you guys connected over. Uh, so it, it's sort of it's interesting to hear you talk about that component to. to think about it happening in both of your musics. Um, cool, so maybe let's give uh, Antichamber uh, a little bit of a listen here uh, with some of uh, what these guys have said in mind. Thank you. 
So that was a segment from the second track on the album, Antichamber. And let me just read who's in the Boston Percussion Group. Matt Chirac, Brian Calhoun, Greg Simons, and Aaron Trant, uh, all of whom are also on uh, either Tulpa or the first track, Flagrant. Um, Brian, did you have some more thoughts about uh, that piece and just working with Curtis and general? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, hearing it again and just remembering, I was like, wow, listening back, like, we did that. Like, there's this kind of thrill and achievement that, like, we said, you know, I think we all feel challenged in the best way to reach our, you know, highest possible achievement together. Um, I, I wanted to comment that, you know, hearing Curtis and all the music that he writes for all these different people, I really believe Curtis writes for his community. Uh, he writes for players who trust each other because to play his music, you really have to. You know, it's so much nuance and so much subtlety and complexity that you really have to trust and know each other really well to play his music. So it's no surprise that there's people who've played, you know, in a solo or a small ensemble and chamber music, and then also in a larger ensemble because, you know, it kind of calls on those people to really have that relationship. Uh, so you're kind of one foot ahead if you have a group of people you really trust and rely on to make this music that's so exquisite and um, worth worth all the, the effort. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, I, I, I would add too, and I'm, I'm the one person on the call who hasn't either played or written your music, Curtis. Uh, but a, as a listener, it really, it, despite the fact that it's clearly challenging, it's music that makes the performers sound great. And, and makes the performers sound like artists. Uh, and that's, you know, that's not a given, and that's not necessarily a criticism either of music that puts performers in different kinds of situations. And, but this is, this is music that really highlights how wonderful the, the virtuosity that you've assembled and, and their artistry. And it's, it's just, it's great to listen to. So uh, it's been a pleasure getting to know it and, and having it in, the, uh, in the catalog. Do you want to add any last thoughts before I sort of give some shout outs to some of the production folks on the record? Sure, uh, just just really quickly, because the excerpt that um, that you played from uh, Antichamber is in some ways what the piece is all about, but in some ways it's a little uncharacteristic of, of the rest of the music. It's kind of the moment where everything congeals into, into a groove, which seems i think like an out of place thing when it happens but it's also something that's been hinted at for a while and because uh lee hyla's name has come up and the idea of music that is sort of momentum driven i think that that is something that i shared with him and that he sort of helped me to figure out how sort of what a certain kind of momentum meant to me and uh and we shared a lot of enthusiasm in avant-garde jazz that's one little passage that i think lee would have in a gentle way sort of frowned upon um, which is kind of funny to me to think about um, in that it's so overt in what it does. Uh, the rest of the of the piece kind of hints at, at that thing that happens. And um, uh, this is, so, you know, we, we didn't agree on everything, but those disagreements were so useful as well. Um, so uh, it's just wonderful to have everybody gathered here, uh, uh, you know, a subset of the amazing team of people that worked on the, on the album assembled here. It's it's been a real thrill to hear some of the things you've you've said. Um, it's definitely helping me to look at some of the music in a different light, uh, which which I really enjoy. Um, and specifically with Antichamber, working with Boston Percussion Group, I should also mention Jonathan Hess and and also Mike Williams, uh, other percussionists who have have participated in the evolution of the piece um, in really significant ways. Uh, um, even though they're not playing on the, on the album itself. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful to them. I'm grateful to all of you. And yeah, glad to glad to shout out people who, who uh, worked on the production side of the album. Uh, if you want to shift back to you, Dan, thank you. <laughs> You're muted, Dan. My apologies. Uh, after a year and a half of doing this, I still sometimes forget to unmute. I was just saying that uh, it's always great to get a chance to shout out the people behind the scenes. So let's do that. Uh, recording engineer, Chris Anderson, audio mastering, Antonio Oliart. Uh, Curtis produced the album uh, with production assistance from Ariana Hughes. Uh, the cover image is by Rosemary, Rosemary Beck. 
uh, as is the back cover image, artwork, photography, Carrie Whittier, uh, and the design and layout was is by Mark Wolf, uh, who does many of our uh, designs at New Focus. So this is Tulpa, Curtis Hughes, FCR 298, came out in April, and it's available all the places you would expect to find music these days. Uh, and I really encourage everybody out there in YouTube land to spend some time with this wonderful music and these wonderful performances. It's, it, it's, uh, it's a really great album. And such a thrill to have music on New Focus, which is a label that I have so much respect for and that I turn to when I want to educate myself about what is exciting that's happening in your music today. Well, that's uh, that's very nice to hear. Thank you, Curtis, and it's a, such a pleasure to be able to host what you guys did on this and 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 hopefully other things in the future. So uh, great. Thanks again, guys, for assembling. Thanks to everybody else for spending a few minutes with us and uh, go check out the music. Take care. Thank you.